And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Sacred Fire Games, currently developing Grand Odyssey, which we'll be getting into today, or tonight, depending on your time zone. The one and only Jeffrey Sedrak. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing amazing. Thank you for having me. Great introduction. Thank you for... Thank you. I've had a fair bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, in a, in yes. a sense. Um, walk me through how you how you got introduced to Tabletop and what made it stick. Okay. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, I had no experience with Tabletop at all. A friend of mine uh, wanted to DM for Dungeons & Dragons. It was a small group. Uh, this was my first introductions. I always was biased about it. Um, but when we played a couple of games, I was like, yeah, I love the roleplay aesthetic of it. Not necessarily Dungeons & Dragons, but uh, the immersion and creativity and adventuring with your friends. It's, yeah, that really hooked me. Unfortunately, that group disbanded. And then I, after a half year, I got the itches and started DMing for myself with a group that expanded and expanded and expanded and created our own game in the process. Which is the game that's going to be released soon. And to be fair with that kind of thing, you are in good company. Yes. There, I've mentioned this in the past, but there's there's a handful of games that kind of started out as originally a bunch of house rules for another game, then got out of hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'd say one one of the biggest examples of that sort of thing is Rollmaster. Rollmaster? Uh... Let's see, uh, Shadow Against the Demon Lord by one of the also the other creators of Dungeons and Dragons. It's also a very good one. Um, I don't know if that started out as a, as a bunch of house rules that got out of hand because I because uh, I haven't spoken with the yeah. guys, but I know that's what happened with um, Rollmaster and with Chivalry and Sorcery. I could yeah. see it happening with Shadow of the Demon Lord, but I've never I haven't spoken to Schwab, so I can't say for cert for certain. Yeah, it's just from stories that I've heard. It's from speculations. Like, he wasn't agreeable where D&D &D was going. Which, I, I can see that, because that's what happened with um, Chivalry and Sorcery. The yeah. guy who was responsible for that, um, he felt that he felt that it wasn't covering the medieval aspect as well as he would have mm -hmm. liked. So, he said, so, so if you want to get anything done right, you got to do it yourself. So he did. Absolutely. Um, I... I 100% agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. And with given th given that given that um I when I was when I was looking at the art I couldn't I couldn't help but notice some some interesting mm -hmm. interesting in, interesting influences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what have you noticed? Um, there's a lot of easter eggs. I kept get, with some, with some of the art style. I kept getting a Bakshi vibe, um, Ralph ba Ralph Bakshi. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't really part of the inspiration, but I'd yeah, say that, uh, that and perhaps a bit of um, Don Bluth. Uh, that is more of the artist input. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, but I am but since since fantasy can take a lot of directions despite what some 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 D&D adherents would tr would try and argue with me about um i uh, i'm a bit i'm a bit curious what what sort of fantasy works served as an inspiration for you when it came to creating um grand odyssey uh not necessarily a single point. Uh, for me, Grand Odyssey is a journey for escapism. Um, 
for mostly as my friend group of neurodivergence a uh, colorful group of uh interesting mindfuckery uh which is always a good time to have on the table uh we go all over the place it's not just one particular genre there's also sci-fi and medieval and fantasy uh but different versions of magic uh, but my core which is also the core of grand odyssey is mythology and ancient human culture mm -hmm. uh, that's what i really use as a basis and try to use the lost past as an homage to give that a chance to reemerge especially in this time that's more and more people of wiccan and pagan and uh grecian mythology comes to surge up i wanted to give it a little boost from here you can escape into that time period it mm -hmm. it's okay nobody will shun you anymore that's in the past mm -hmm. now with th with that now with that in mind um given given a lot of the things that that kind of came, that kind of came out of the path of evolution between what you were playing bef before you started creating um i us i'd like to ask about the rome that all roads lead to mm -hmm. in in this partic in this particular case um are you using a d20 as as a core mechanic or do you have a different um, core mechanic that all roads lead to no it's a, a d20 game mechanic mm -hmm. to just keep it simple it is the most popular one um, other dice system works fine but it is a d20 system uh, the focus is more on the d4 mm -hmm. than the d20 uh, but every check you make is a d20 um, just out of curiosity wh why the caltrop <laughs> uh, this is more of mathematics uh, to don't get a power creep in a sense because the things when people want to role play and if you have the introverted people because I have a couple of those and to challenge them into role play is very difficult for them because they felt held back mm -hmm. so I introduced the system from alright you can just roll a stealth check as you want like you want to roll stealth sure but uh, if you take steps by saying from, hey, I have this and I have this, I can give you a boost for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made a introduction uh, explanation video uh, of a rogue going uh, off the party with a paladin, climbing out of the sewers and going for a target. It's like, I'm going to move from shadow to shadow. I'm going to hide myself in my dark cloak. And then I'm going to mask my footsteps with his rhythm so he will not notice me approaching. So I will say, all right, that's three different things. You are very skilled. So I give you 3d4 on addition to your stealth check. But this can also backfire because the DM can say, well, first you move from shadow to shadow, but your paladin friend has a torch. You use your cloak to mask yourself, but you just came out of the sewer. He will smell you before he can see you. But you are skilled enough for the footsteps. So that will be two disadvantage d4s and one advantage. So all, all in all, only one d4 subtraction. So you allow the player to roleplay their things without realizing they're roleplaying. It's a little trickery. And my introverted friends loved it. They are now roleplaying like the best of them. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with that in mind, with that in mind, since, since you're since you're using, as we as we in the temple call the most ubiquitous role playing games, um, DNA on some on some levels, mm -hmm. um, I would I would there's a few things I'd like to ask on on that front. Starting <clears throat> with um, cl starting with classes. Um, yes. Now. I know that you have a. I know that it's. It sounds like you have a bunch of classes and subclasses that you're that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, but let's let's address the multi-classing problem because a lot of games. This is one of those things that they struggle with, and I'm cur I'm curious how because a lot of times with multi-classing, 
you you ha you're taking a lot of disadvantages to try and to try and get some kind of advantage. Yep. Um. Or or there's or there's way too many hoops that you need to that you need to jump through in order to make a multi-classing work and a lot of traps. Looking at you. That's correct. Um. How are you approaching multi-classing? Since customization seems to be one of your battle cries. Yeah, customization is definitely a uh, top feature. So, uh, unlike uh, Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons, uh, who has a limited set for a skill, like you need to be a Dex 13 for a rogue, I toss that out of the window. You don't need that. Because if you want to play a shitty rogue that fumbles their lockpick skills, you can do that. If you want to play that, go ahead, do that. Uh, another thing is, like... Uh, at level four, uh, at uh, every four class level, I keep that the same as D and D, uh, because it's a very easy uh, way to add features. Uh, is when the ASI kicks in, so you can do the same thing with the plus two ability uh, or a feat. But in addition, you can also choose. I'm going to add a total of three points to add to my skill tree, like three points on my stealth, or one on my stealth, one on survival, one on knowledge. Uh, for instance, or harvesting, whatever you want. Or, here's where the customization kicks in. At level 4, you can take a subclass feature of any other class. Which means, as a rogue, you can take a barbarian subclass feature from level 3. But only from level 3, to keep that balance. At level 8, you can take a subclass of level 6 only. So there's a limiter, so you cannot go all hams. But it gives the variety of subclassing, we call that alter classing, because you're not multi-classing, mm -hmm. uh, without sacrificing your main class. You can still go to the level 20 with their uh, game-breaking capstone ability uh, without sacrificing that, uh, making unique characters. Um, but in a sense, you cannot be a very powerful creature of a specific subclass, like if you want to uh, play an assassin, because uh, I have skills at level 3 for subclass, 6, uh, 12, 14, and also 19. Mm -hmm. With the subclass features, you can never get the 19 capstone of a subclass with the skill, only if you pick that specific subclass as the main class. So you will not feel like, yeah, but now my subclass gets stolen away. No, you have the capstone, uh, capstone ability that is completely overpowered. So you will feel the best assassin compared to the other wannabe assassins, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So you will not feel like, all right, I'm doing jumping through all these hoops to get the thing. That's like no, no, you get the ability to choose. Do you want it or not? And that's it. Mm -hmm. Now, the other th the other thing that I want that I wanted to address, because you've. With the way with the way combat works, um, one of the obvious questions about martial classes is is already addressed. But mm -hmm. I do want to address the magic question a bit because um, are you are you using the same the same spell charge and spell per day kind of no. approach? Nope. <laughs> thank no. You, thank the Lord for that. No. Nope. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have. Uh, I don't know if you still agree with that, but I have a mana system. Um, I so with I'm perfectly points? fine with mana system. I I just I did not like the Vancian model when I started role playing games. And that has not changed over the years. <laughs> no. It's a fun easy mechanic for people that are beginners. Like I see uh D&D 5E as a starting point. Like I wanted to go in. This is easy to understand, easy to follow, but now I want more. And that's the game that I'm creating from. I want more. This doesn't make sense for me at all the points. From for me, the I've I've talked about this in the past, and I'll prob and I'll probably keep talking about it as long as people keep <laughs> insisting that there's no, that there's nothing wrong with the Vancian model. Um, my issues with it have always have been have been twofold. One, it is very much an artifact of what came before, specifically chainmail. Oh, two, because of the whole limited thing, unless you take a long rest, um, you end up you you can very easily end up with the what I, what I like to call the rainy day paradox, or 
You ever have you ever have one of those people like that. who who um who holds on who holds on to who holds on to the, all their mega elixirs in say a Final Fantasy game, even though mm-hmm. thinking that thinking that they might need it later. And then For the final boss, yeah. and then <laughs> they don't need to, anything. <laughs> They'd be like, "Huh, all right." <laughs> no, it's like, what? What am I gonna do with the? What if? What am I gonna do with these ninety-nine megalixes? What if I need them for later? It's like I could have used it in so many fights. That's just, and why? Ah. <laughs> and and everybody else is like, "Dude, this is the final boss of this of the story. What the hell?" Um. Yeah. No. But. So, so be- that's also where you have this, that also creates the Nova problem, where people just unload all the sp- save all the spells for the B bag and then just unload all of them. Yep. Uh, but the other the other issue that I that I had was more of a narrative one. Mm-hmm. The Vancian model is called that because it's based it's based on the magic system that's used in the Dying Earth books by Jack Vance. Which works in that setting because magic is treated as this uber complicated form of mathematics, and the and Dying Earth is more swords and sorcery than high fantasy. But when magic is more is more or less everywhere in the setting, but not quite setting that that stuff like D and D and Pathfinder have. It's a little harder to justify. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Um, if a system seems fun, you need to really think like, is this the system that would work for me as well? And how would people react to it? Uh, the long grass fix everything is not correct in a story sense like basically what it's saying like oh you lost almost your arm but now it's fully attached after a little nap like if if it's like a wizard or like a regenerative power or something like that okay sure but if a fighter has no magical abilities he's just like no 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 I'm just I just sleep it off literally which is that's always that's always funny to me because because I will hear from I will hear from the grogs who I keep picking on about how about how more modern games feel to, feel too video gamey, and I always respond, "Do you not know your history?" <laughs> you know, because it's, it's not like it's not like the gold box um, PC games weren't a thing. Yeah. Or or the or the um, or some of the or some of the craziness that happened in stuff like wizardry or um, might and magic. Um, especially especially in the later in the later games where all the, you think you're doing a high fantasy adventure and then all of a sudden aliens show up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean if you can fling it or wing it uh, properly, you can do like the D and D with mind flayers. Yeah, there's still fantasy creatures and all that, and they're also on the caves uh, in the caves on the ground. So not completely alien. <laughs> There's but also yeah, the, there's also the fact that the most po- one of the most popular, um, one of the most popular ori- original era modules is Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Which, I haven't played that one. Which ha- which has which which has a alien ship with <laughs> with with full on ray guns and everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want my players to find that. Expedition to the Barrier Peaks is an old, old, old mod. Like this was, er, this is early days stuff. Uh, maybe so, that's why I haven't played it. So. But given that, but given that, given that you're using a mo- a mana system, which base, which I can inf- would I be able to infer that that's essentially akin to akin to spell points or ma- or magic points and a lot of other systems, just in this in that principle. In a sense, yeah, you can see it like a video game static, like you have your health bar that has a number, and your we call it spirit bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, we call it spirit for a reason, like the spirit and um, the flow of energy, which is also magic. So spellcasters can use it, but also martial classes because they're using their inner fighter spinner uh, spirit. 
so they can use special techniques like a full-on spin attack like a blade blade uh, or a launch attack going more in uh, hemo uh, practices like i did a lot of research about comebacks and ar uh, combats and armor and weaponry mm -hmm. uh, so every class is benefiting from the spirit and um, with my brawler class or the monk class for other uh, games, um, the spirit is then reflavored that they can fuel chi points because chi is inner spirit, your fighter spirit. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense to make it uh, spirit. Yeah. Uh, so every class is benefiting from it. Now, taking that into account, um, how easy or difficult would it be for someone to play a gish? Um, if you're not familiar, Gish is the is a shorthand for characters who can who can both fight at, and cast somewhat effectively. Uh, you can definitely make characters like that. I have uh, two of my players that uh, did an alpha task with that, uh, who basically made a blade singer, uh, which is fun, and uh, he tried to break like my. Uh, assignment was literally from break my game literally break my game do not hold back and he didn't break the game he was still on par with the rest of the party members and it was fun it was a unique way of playing uh, so still the rule of customization is still on, uh, on par so if you want to do it yes you can do it and you can have fun mm -hmm. uh. now with with that with that in mind, um, is is magic fire and forget, or are there or are there ways to customize um, spells? <laughs> um, well, um, in the core rulebook that uh, that's we're mostly talking about, because that's the one that's being released. That's is actually a compressed version of the book that I actually wanted to create, mm -hmm. but I have spoken to Dave of Nor Nerdarchy, and he gave me uh, the advice to keep it small, create a community, make it cheap so everybody can get into it easier, and do not do the game thing that... Make three books that you need to buy to play the game. I wasn't planning on doing that, but uh, I came, uh, got his advice and took it in consideration that I made the core book, which is very limited. So there will only be three races in it and four classes. However, the actual book that will be released later, when this is getting a little bit of traction, and making community will have 15 classes in it 15 unique classes one of which is the sorcerer and it's not like the DD sorcerer the sorcerer in my game is here is a table of spell circles and depending on your level is the amount of spell circles you can combine and literally it says create your own spells there's a table of what the damage it does uh, how much spirit you can put in to make it stronger and you can at low level, make insane powerful spells, but then you're out of spirit and cannot do anything until you rest for so many days because mm -hmm. you need to roll for every hour of rest. Uh, so yeah, you can be very powerful or extremely weak. It's more like the creativity of the players. Again, focusing on the creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, customization and creating your own spells, definitely a possibility, but in a, the next book, not this one. Mm -hmm. And with with that in with that in mind there's a few there's a few archetypes that I'd be curious what would be the rough equivalent in your in your system yes um let's start let's start let's let's start off with with the good old barbarian barbarian all right um or or or, Berser or berserker or or its equivalent yeah, no, the barbarian is the common trait. Like, a barbarian is a barbarian. I do not have to change it. There's no copyright on that. It is a barbarian. Uh, they have a similar rage, uh, basically the same, but it has uh, other features added onto it. And also, it is not, like, limited amount of uses for short rest or long rest. It is, again, tied to your spirit, your battle rage, your battle spirit. Uh, so you can, if you have roll high on your spirit, you can rage a lot. And unlike the it lasts for a minute, or if you attack or get attacked, uh, the ruling for my rage is more like as long as you take aggressive actions, including rushing towards 
one or focus on someone, you keep your rage. So it's not like, oh, I cannot hit because he flies. So I lose my rage. No, no, no. You still want to murder him. You're still angry. Uh, you keep that. So it's not like for the little shenanigans. So, oh, yeah, technically you lose your rage. Uh, so uh, that's one change. And the other one is that the barbarian main class focus on critical damage. They really focus on the crits. They can, at high level, do insane amount of damage when they crit. Mm -hmm. So that is the focus of the barbarian. Yeah. Critical damage. So they're a crit fisher. Yes, definitely. And with my system that I also explain of the more you describe what you do, you get more d4s on it. And that's when I went also for the Pathfinder 2nd edition because I love that mechanic, is if you roll 10 above their dodge uh, or AC, for me it's dodge, uh, you crit mm -hmm. or on a natural 20. So if you have a party that supports the Barbarian, they can crit every attack. Yep. Now... I, now, well, this one, this one might be a bit out, a bit out there, but given given the multi genre approach, could someone do a artificer in your setup? I have a mechanic, yeah, and the subclasses of the mechanic, because uh, unlike D and D, who has uh, spells that are say like, uh, yeah, these are the spells and you can reflavor them. Uh, I made a set. Uh, list that they can do of creating gadgets. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using uh, gear bits to create things and they have a certain cost and they can easily collect them just like gold coins for the rest but they can literally like, oh here's a dagger we, nobody used it, I dismantle it in gear bits and make something awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can make tools and items and grenades and whatnot, not or headlights for and give that to players who doesn't have dark vision or something like that. Uh, they can literally suit up the party. Mm -hmm. The fun thing are the subclasses of the mechanic because they have the cyborg that can literally create limbs for also other player members because you can lose limbs. Um, uh, the battle mech. I don't think I have to say what that does. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one is the deployer that literally makes swarms of drones that fight for you. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit my take of the artificer. Mm -hmm. So not have scientist magic; it is full on science. Which I'm per I'm perfectly fine. I'm perfectly fine with because trying to trying to do the si science magic with the canon artificer. The problem with that is that it is that there's a ceiling in terms of what settings you can put that in. Yes, namely e namely Eberron, but. I'm, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, to sh do you have it? Do you have it that alchemist is a is a sub is a subclass of that, or alchemist is its own thing? Alchemist is simply a um, uh, what is it? Uh, a profession. Mm -hmm. Like just like backgrounds, you can also get um, depending on your backgrounds and upbringings, because uh, those are also character creation things that you get bonuses from, you can get a profession or I can choose a profession and alchem uh, alchemist or the alchemist set is one of them and you can be trained in it or expertise so you can get a full list on potions and recipes of how to create these potions, how long it will take what is the cost of these things um Literally every portion that I make will have a set of ingredients and how to create it. Uh, focus of my studies about Wiccan uh, and all that. Yeah, I I can certainly get behind that. Um, well, you you already answered you already kind of answered monks, so so that one that, <laughs> one's, out the, that one's out the window. Um, but. What about a assassin? Assassin. Um, the main class uh, I have named the scoundrel uh, because rogue is more of a subclass uh, than a main class. Uh, the scoundrel, uh, just like D and D, focus on the sneak attack, staying behind, not necessarily be in the center. Uh, however. I got a lot of complaints about the assassination skills because that's also how I built my book. I went on forums and see what the complaints are about Pathfinder, Call of Cthulhu, uh, Shadow Against the Demon Lord, Dungeons and Dragons, and 
take those snippets and improve it. Mm-hmm. One of my players also played the assassin of D&D. And having the ability of only if you are first in the attack uh, in the attacking order and you have attacked, will the skill go off? And afterwards, it does nothing. Sucks. Uh, so for this assassin subclass that I've made is uh, a new feature called undetected. If you are stealthy and nobody has seen you except for your allies, you have the status undetected. When you make an action to show yourself or like break stealth, you are detected. Even if you roll stealth again, they know you are there. So you do not get the undetected skill. Mm-hmm. If you are undetected and make a sneak attack on a target, that target is forced to make a fortitude save or in other terms, constitution save. If they fail, they instantly die. You assassinate them. Mm-hmm. If they succeed, they take the sneak attack damage. And you can say, well, yeah, but then all my bosses will get killed. No, they got legendary resistance. If they fail, they just poop. And then the squishy scoundrel is then next to the boss alone. So I think it balanced itself out at that point. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about the warlock? Ah, yeah, this is one of my favorites. Uh, then I can immediately also deliberate about the Priest and Paladin, because they are a set. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike the other classes, they do not get subclasses at all. Um, they have their main class abilities, and when they are level 1, they choose a deity. Literally a god. Mm-hmm. Um, in my game, uh, I also have dragon gods. Uh, for instance. Um, if they follow a god of any pantheon, I got Nordic pantheon or any other mythology pantheon. Uh, I think in this book I have one dragon god, one Lunestrian god, which is a pantheon custom for my setting, mm-hmm. and a Japanese god, uh, Ebisu. Mm-hmm. Um, if they follow the deity, the deity has their main things. They have their do and don'ts to get uh, devotion points. Mm-hmm. The more devotion points you get, the more bonuses you get. So you need to be faithful. Mm -hmm. This also counts for other classes that just want to follow and get those bonuses. But then they also have skills for the priest, paladin, and warlock specifically. The priests are the symbol or or the words of the deity. The paladin are the symbol of the deity. And the warlock is the dirty deeds. So they still follow the tendons, but they are allowed to break it a little bit. The thing that is most importantly for the Warlock, and that I think a lot of people would be very happy, is at level 1, they just get Eldritch Blast. They don't have to choose it. They get that skill. Uh, But it is tailored to their deity. Uh, For instance, uh, this is more uh, in my head. It's not canon. If they are a Warlock of Tiamat, their Eldritch Blasts can do one of the chromatic damages. And if they have multiple... Elders Blast, like the four. Uh, my Elders Blast works a little bit different because I cannot do the same. Uh, they can then do, do uh, one Elders Blast Fire, the other one Frost, the other Lightning, uh, the other one Thunder, for instance. Uh, like it is tailored to the deity, and they just get that. Uh, also, if they are a priest, paladin, warlock, the deity has a set of spells that they get. That is, off their spell list, they do not have to choose it, they will have it. Because that makes sense. Because literally the deity is giving that power. Why should you choose then? That's something that always irritated me in D&D. Because it is your custom deity. It is your deity. Why shouldn't you have it? And you don't have to use it, but you have it. So that's the Warlock Peace Paladin. Taking that into into account... um, one of the one of the more popular subclasses for warlocks is he- is hex blades. Oh yeah, since, yeah. <laughs> since subclass since warlocks in your take don't get subclasses, how would you how would you handle the equivalent of a of a, a hex blade in your system? Uh, the easiest way to do that is at level four when you get your ASI, uh, you just take the subclass of the arcane fighter, mm-hmm. and you basically get the same benefits. You can cast low-level spells. You can get the uh, 
a hex spell would be able to be cast at that point, uh, or something similar to the hex spell, um, then you're already there. It will be a little bit slower because the Hexblade Warlock gets at level one. You get in my version, you get at level four. But you get the same thing. You get multiple spells. You get martial combat capabilities. Uh, and you don't sacrifice any levels in Warlock. Yeah. And now, pa since you mentioned paladins, I'd like to dive into that because. Mm -hmm. um, Paladins have a unfortunate reputation. Have an unfortunate reputation, especially when, especially whenever somebody enforces the lawful stupid problem. Yep. Which, since you don't have alignments, you're not dealing with that. Thank nope. God. I hate alignments. I don't mind. I don't mind. I don't mind alignments. I just don't like the nine alignment grid. Yeah. When it's used like a broad faction allegiance, it's perfectly fine. When you're Dealing with enforced behavior and trying to put it in a morality system, no, doesn't no, because everybody has a different view of evil. Plus, I firmly believe that the alignment system was never meant to be a morality system. It was meant to be which of which of the which of which part of the cosmos likes you or hates you. Yeah, more of the deity parts, because it doesn't do much of the rest. It's more like a barrier between Fey Fiends and Celestial, I think. It's... I... I from everything that I've seen, it's, it's very much... I think it was... I think it was outright stated that the big inspiration was... Um, was the Law and Chaos pantheons in Morcock's Eternal Champion books. I cannot confirm that. I do not know. Oh. Um, You've, he was the guy responsible for El, for Elric, Elric of Melnibene. Ah. Uh. Ah, uh, but when it comes when it comes to paladins, are the, do they have do they have to do the whole choice of deity thing just as just as well? Uh, when, same as the priest paladin and war, uh, priest and warlock. Uh, at level one, you choose a paladin, uh, uh <laughs> paladin, uh, a deity. Uh, but because of the very large plethora, you can do whatever you want. Like, I have evil deities as well. Uh, so you don't have to be the lawful good one or anything. It's just like, every deity has a do or don't, or else you're going to lose devotion. Uh, other than that, do whatever you want. Like, just don't break the rules of your, de uh, rules of your deity, and it's fine. Oh. And I'm getting... The th when it comes to the whole being able to cast low level spells, I think part of the reason that doesn't that doesn't have an impact in in a lot in a lot of games is because of that whole defined spell level thing, which does mm -hmm. which doesn't which doesn't scale. I know some people might might say well, might say you can you can still cast low level spells at higher levels, which you can, but so many half casters have it capped at a at a certain amount. Yeah, and I'm ge I'm guessing. When it comes to you doing a MP approach, was one of the goals to make sure that low level spells can still be viable even at late game? Uh, the low level spells that I have have more unique features, and uh, high levels have the more stronger effects. But to instead of upcasting or something that DD has, I have upgraded spells. Uh, which means, for instance, I have a uh, one of my fun spells is like you can conjure a little shack. Like it's basically a house that you can summon where the party can rest in, but you can at higher levels upgrade it to a house with rooms and a fireplace, and then later into a tower that can be defended, and later can be upgraded into a keep or a mansion or a castle. Uh, but you do not have to choose those spells. As long as you have the previous spell, you get that in your spell list. So you have all the versions of the spell. Now, with with that in mind, I'd like to I'd like to tackle a bit on the on the combat end because there's one mm -hmm. thing that you're do that you're doing that I find very interesting first, and that is 
splitting ar splitting armor and def and defense instead yes. of instead of a unified AC with some maybe bit maybe little bits of damage reduction if you're lucky. Yeah, no, that's actually how the game started. That was my pet peeve because it didn't make sense for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've I've seen I've seen it in some other works here and there, but it's one, it's one that I ca that I wish would become standard, because in doing yeah. that in doing that you you're able to you're able to better create a dividing line between between say a between say a heavily armored fighter. And a slight and a slightly less heavily armored um, thief, or, yeah. or just a, or just a fencer. They're still yeah. ar they're still armored, but they're going to be relying more on not getting hit than tanking it. Yeah, and then it's a choice uh, from: Do you want to risk taking a lot of damage when you get hit, or you're going to play it a little bit safer and taking some armor and take a couple of hits, but only tr subtract one damage off your total hit pool. And I'm guess I'm guessing that he, I'm guessing when it comes to the action economy, it, it are you d you're doing a you're doing a variety of actions instead of just move instead of just movement standard bonus. <laughs> yeah, um, I have um, three forms of act. Well, technically four, but. Uh, three forms of main action. One is a full action, which is a combination of the main action and the talent action. Mm -hmm. uh, talent actions is something you are very skilled in. That is mostly skills that are tied to your main class. Think of the rage abilities or uh, special techniques of fighters or monks or brawlers in my case. Uh, the main actions are uh, the general actions that can be a movement action, that can be an attack action, that can be a use action, uh, that can be a grab action, that can be whatever there's an entire list that i have all these things are main actions if you combine those two you can do a full action uh, those are more like uh, very powerful skills they are meant to be only uh, used or cast once per round uh, because they are very powerful uh, for instance uh, one of the things that i've created with my version of the sleep spell it is a save instead of hit point based uh, so you can use it still at high levels without upcasting it. It's just your save uh, against your spell save. Uh, but it can be very broken if you have uh, a multiclass of a fighter, have two main actions, uh, and then an action surge, so you can put everyone to sleep in one round, so it is a full action. Just like, no, if, it doesn't care how many main actions you have. You need also your talents actually to combine it with. Mm -hmm. And with when it comes to when it comes to attack when it comes to attacking since you had mentioned t you had mentioned doing some doing some research <laughs> i'm guessing that you are not doing any sort of basic attack no well you have your basic attack if you don't want to use your uh, spirit because uh, you need to keep in mind as well from if you have no spirit to do fancy things you still need to be able to attack as a fighter or else you're useless so if you're low with all your Spirit, you can still just swing your sword, or swing your club, or hammer away, uh, or shoot with your bow. Uh, you can still do that. But if you want to do powerful strike or a launch attack, like a enemy is just one square away from you, you can still do a launch attack without attacking up opportunity or getting into their melee range. Uh, you can still do that. Or if you're surrounding a spin attack to attack all of them around you. Uh, so there are standard attacks still. Because you need to be able to do that if you are depleted. You should not ever be useless. Uh, but there are more focus on special techniques. Mm -hmm. Now, with with all that with all that in mind, since you you mentioned do, you mentioned doing a lighter book before you're doing the heavier one. Um, yeah. For that lighter one, what are you shooting for as far as page count? Uh, I thought I was going for 200 pages, but right now I am at 133 and I'm pretty much done. I'm just finishing up the last pages of the monsters and since I have so many pages still left, I'm going to do a little bit more detail and flourish. Um, so I think at most 140. Mm -hmm. 
but it's very light very compact and with the uh, very specific view of readability um uh, i don't like what most modern books have that you have a text that goes down half it starts half a page and it goes down and goes half another page or only two ro rules uh on another page so you might overlook it mm -hmm. if i have if you go on my book and you go to the fighter or martial class it will be on two pages both pages will be in front of you you don't have to look on any other pages those two pages are all the information you need next page will be the mage mm -hmm. that's it it's readable you know what you have and it's easy to understand mm -hmm. well, I, I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops but with all that said I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way out onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> Absolutely. Sometimes you need a little bit of madness to keep them a bit, bit sane. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. I would lovely uh, would love to come back uh, anytime as possible. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Here, here. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and come on and visit to see to see the madness at play around here. Jeez, English monk. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>